Thank you all for coming. This is Hamish's first of a series of four. We're very happy to have him back. You're all set. Thank you very much. Um, just before we start, just wanted to give you a couple of stock announcements. If you'd like to, you can get up and uh, move around a little bit, rest your, rest your back, stretch your legs, stretch your back, rest your legs, whichever you like. Um, and the other thing I'd like to tell folks is if uh, you hear something during the talk that you'd like to ask about, you don't have to wait until the end. The only thing I would tell you is that I'd probably take any kind of long answer or in-depth answer and put that off until the end so that we don't interrupt the presentation too much. But today I'll be talking about the first of four cultural topics from American history in the 20th century. And the first of these is the Harlem Renaissance. You've probably all heard of a guy named Morgan Freeman. Uh, Morgan Freeman, very famous actor, said a few years ago, it's kind of an interesting thing because it sets off this big controversy about the, the status of African American history as opposed to American history. What Mr. Freeman said was that there should really be no uh, a Black History Month, no African American history, because he said African American history is American history. And so this started kind of a controversy. And people were wondering, is African American history enough of a separate subject to treat it differently? Right? And what I would say is at times yes, at times no. If you look at African American history, for instance, during the Civil War, one of the things you find is that African American soldiers had virtually the same statistical experience that white soldiers did. Same number of people killed, wounded, uh, the same number of people who died of disease, the same number of medals given out, the same number of people who were arrested or even shot for desertion. So you don't find that there's really too much difference. Here, in the Harlem Renaissance, which we're going to look at, which occurred during the 1920s, and mainly in New York City, we actually have a case for talking about African American history as totally separate from American history at the time. It's very interesting as to why. And you're probably aware, during the 1920s, this is the decade after the First World War, and America went to war in 1917. Many of her young men went to war with them. And among these are people that you would know about, people like William Faulkner, uh, people like Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and they are going to go off. And when they come back to the United States in the 1920s, they begin to talk about a world that's kind of gotten out of control. This is known as the lost generation. So when you read F. Scott Fitzgerald, when you're reading John Steinbeck, a lot of Ernest Hemingway during this time, you're reading stories about things like dislocation, alienation. And a lot of the world will respond to people like T.S. Eliot when he writes The Hollow Men in 1925. And he writes, the end of the poem is this. This is the way the world ends. 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 Not with a bang, but with a whimper. And this is very kind of, uh, how would you say, pessimistic poetry. Looking at a world that where we're a little bit alienated. Going to be very different if you're looking at African American history during this time. 20th century, when you look at it as a whole, African Americans are severely oppressed during the 20th century. But you also find that between 1900 and about 1960, the strides made by African America are actually very, very significant. And in fact, one could say that we've come a longer way than kind of we've lagged behind. Now, when we look at the Harlem Renaissance, therefore, we're really looking at one of the periods where this is going to be very marked. This is one of the greatest cultural explosions in all of American history. And when we think of the Harlem Renaissance, usually it'll be people like Duke Ellington that we'll think of. Very famous composer, one of the best popular music composers we've ever had. But really the Harlem Renaissance goes a lot deeper and a lot broader than that. And I'll be touching on some of these points today. But the story of the Harlem Renaissance really begins right after the Civil War. It begins really a long time ago. And what you're looking at right now is a map of the southern United States that had gone Confederate during the war. This area, after the Civil War, was absolutely destroyed. And there are a couple of things that are going to change about this very quickly. First, physically, the South is absolutely prostrate. Every farm has been burned. Every acre of cotton has been either taken out, stolen, or burned. Um, there is that actually, in 1865, folks, this is a statistical fact. This is not just me speaking. In all of the area that you see, there is not one place where two miles of railroad track exists intact. This entire area has been basically gone over and made into a parking lot. It's going to have to be rebuilt. And thus, one of the things that you will find that happens to African America after the war is that there is a great deal of work to do, and there is a large number of people in the South 
who have been doing work and a lot of forced labor for over 200 years by now. And thus, what we will find is that for a lot of the white Southerners, they're going to look to African Americans as people who are going to be their labor force when they want to rebuild this area. Now, of course, that's not going to go over very well because in 1863, Abraham Lincoln creates the Emancipation Proclamation, and in 1865, the United States passes the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits slavery. Now, because of this, in name, all of the African Americans living here are going to be free, but what we're going to find very quickly is a couple of things. Number one, that there will be attempts to ask African Americans to leave the South where they have been an oppressed and enslaved peoples for literally centuries. There are attempts to get them to go out west. Out west, there's free land. Well, not free, I'm sorry. It would cost you $5 for 160 acres. And what you're gonna do with that land, I know, living in Connecticut, that sounds real bad, I realize. But um, what you're gonna do with that land is farm. And if, we, if you think about it, folks, slavery existed in the United States from 1619 to 1865. That's 246 years. During that time, African Americans overwhelmingly have participated in one industry, and that's agriculture. Thus, it seems like a fantastic idea. You get folks to leave the South where they're really not welcome except as a forced labor force, and then you can get them out into free lands. The fact of the matter is they do actually do this uh, for a little while with a few people. But out of the four, four and a half million slaves that lived in the United States in, in 1860, only about 35,000 will actually end up becoming what they call exodusters. And that is gathering in places in the South and then going out into the West. So places like Kansas and Oklahoma, California will attract some people, but really not many. In reality, most of the African Americans in the United States that had been in slavery are going to basically be returned to that state under a Southern socioeconomic system we call Jim Crow. The laws will be passed that will ensure that African Americans who have been freed will not have a political voice by not giving them the vote, and that we can use them as a, a, a how would I say, a labor force when necessary. Uh, for instance, folks, if you get a few traffic tickets, you're probably not happy about it, probably don't like to see the police going down the road. If you're African American in Mississippi and you're 1866, you have something the equivalent of a traffic ticket, you'd better run when the police come. Because what they will do is arrest you and then make you work off the ticket. Now, how much that ticket is would just depend on how much work they happen to need at the time. And this can be very oppressive. So African Americans really are oppressed down south, but they don't seem to really know what they can do otherwise. However, as the 19th century wears on, we do see a lot of progress being made. The man that you're looking at now is a, a gentleman named Booker T. Washington. And Booker T. Washington opens up Tuskegee Institute in 1883. And when he does this, you've probably heard the name Tuskegee. Tuskegee is an institute of higher education like many other. But what's interesting about this is that Washington basically said that if African Americans were able to own real estate, invariably, they would become respected middle class members of American society. After all, owning land is basically what makes you a person of your own. This is since the 1700s we have felt this. And so in order to do this, Booker T. Washington opened up Tuskegee as both an institute of higher education, but every student who attended there also had to have a trade. Thus, you could study history, you could study Latin, you could study mathematics, but you were also going to be studying carpentry or plumbing or shoemaking, whatever it might be. Washington's idea is that if you give folks a trade, you're going to have to get paid for it, and sooner or later, you're going to have the money come in that's going to allow you to advance. Now, a lot of people really don't like this at all, because to Washington, this is going to be a slow process. It's going to take years and years, and a lot of people really want that progress coming a lot quicker. And this is one man, actually from the area, William E. B. Du Bois. Now, you may have heard of Du Bois. He's actually from Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, and Du Bois is really the first real activist voice of African America. He calls himself a Negro rights activist. And Du Bois is really responsible for a lot of the things we see in the 20th century with African American progress. Now, first of all, in the 1890s, Du Bois, who was a Harvard-educated sociologist, and 
even in that, he is a very unique figure because in the 1890s, you don't get many African Americans getting degrees from the best private uh, universities in the country. Now, he actually studies the lives of African Americans in Philadelphia. Strangely enough, he comes up with the conclusion that African Americans in Philadelphia are kind of like white people in Philadelphia. They want to have a job, they want to have a good place to live, and they want their kids to live better than they did. This is earth-shaking for many of the people who actually study African Americans during this time, believe it or not. But what he will also do is begin to talk about African America as essentially a separate and ominous group of Americans. He talks about a, a communication through the veil, he says. He says, if you think you're speaking to a black person and you think you're actually getting through to them, you're wrong. You are speaking through a veil to them, and if there will always be this veil between the white and black races. This is something, he said, you have to take notice of because if we are not given these rights sooner or later, that is, the right to vote, the right to hold land, the right to bring lawsuits in courts, the right to testify, and the right to be on juries, he says, there will be social and even civil problems that might even amount to rioting and war. Now besides this, he is also going to do a couple of things that are very much visible in the uh, public eye. One of them is that he believes that a small, talented group of African Americans should lead the way in making progress for African America. He calls this his Talented Tenth. And in 1909, he begins an organization that is designed to promote the interests of that talented tenth and of African Americans in general. Now he, and you might notice, actually the other two folks forming this organization are not black at all. In fact, they're very much uh, very wealthy white folks from New York, um, Mary, uh, Mary Oldington Worth and Story Moorfield. The three of them together will form the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Peoples, or the NAACP. Now they formed this in 1909, and the reason that they formed the organization is to band together economic power in order to be able to bring lawsuits that will end things like segregation, unequal facilities in public. Now here's the thing, the NAACP begins to do its job, begins to do it actually quite well, and this is going to be a problem for a, a lot of the folks in the country, but I'll talk about that in a second. The mission of the NAACP is to promote equality of rights and to eradicate caste or race prejudice among the citizens of the United States, to advance the interest of colored citizens, to secure for them impartial suffrage, that is the vote, and to increase their opportunities for securing justice in the courts, education for the children, employment according to their ability, and complete equality before the law. Now here's the thing, the NAACP is essentially going to do something that has been in the air for a while. A lot of people believe that the Jim Crow South is going to have to change at some point. So when they begin to bring their cases before the courts, they begin actually to have a good deal of success. And this is going to cause problems uh, in the southern United States. Now another thing that Du Bois does is he is going to publish a magazine, an African American um, social and literary magazine called The Crisis in which he will bring a lot of attention to these issues. Now by doing this, as we move into the 20th century, African Americans therefore seem to be doing quite well. And in fact, in 1920, they're going to receive this man for what you might call their chief operating officer. This is James Weldon Johnson. This is actually one of the first African American major figures of the NAACP. He is a lawyer and he is a diplomat. He has been named actually as uh, consuls to Venezuela, uh, another uh, Latin American country by Theodore Roosevelt. This is a man who's very well respected in the United States. And you might also have heard of him because he also wrote the song, Lift Up Every Voice and Sing. I'm not sure if you've ever heard this before, but right, Lift Every Voice and Sing Till Earth and Heaven Ring. This is a very famous civil rights song now. But what's really interesting about this man is that besides being widely talented, and besides kind of writing the song and being in the NAACP, he directs the NAACP's energy towards securing legal equality. And he begins to have so much success that he begins to really arouse a lot of opposition. What you're looking at right now is a poster of a movie made in 1915. You've probably heard of this movie, The Birth of a Nation. Now, 
and the birth of a nation. It's kind of an interesting thing. Griffiths explores a lot of uh, American history in a, actually, what he wanted to do was make a trilogy of movies. He made Birth of a Nation, and he also made uh, another movie, I believe it's called uh, uh, Prejudice, I'm sorry. Um, but in these movies, his view of the United States is not what a lot of people might think of the Ku Klux Klan today. But in fact, it does reflect a lot of our uh, social mores at the time. Woodrow Wilson, whose name you might be familiar with as one of the presidents of the United States, said the white men were roused in the post-Civil War South by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. And you think to yourself, boy, that's uh, not what I ever read in the history books about them. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, there are really two Ku Klux Klans. The first one is gonna be formed in 1866 in Pulaski, Tennessee. That Ku Klux Klan is made up of Southern soldiers who wish to prevent African Americans from voting. It's one mission, one type of people. By 1871, Ulysses Grant had sent down about 40,000 troops into the South, and they had gone in and literally burned out the Klan. The Klan was non-existent by 1872, 1873. The shards of the thought remained, however, and in 1915, during the presidency of Woodrow Wilson, the Ku Klux Klan comes back, and it comes back very powerfully. Now, what you're looking at here is a Ku Klux Klan march in Washington, D.C., in which 120,000 people participated. This is a very popular Klan, and I, I realize it's a serious subject, but this is kind of an interesting Klan because they hate everybody. Um, they don't like black people, that's correct, and you probably assume that, but they don't like Jewish people either. They don't like Catholic people either. They really don't like labor unions, you know? So whatever you have, these are the folks that really want to preserve essentially a white Anglo-Saxon way of life, whatever that might be, right? Now, you might also notice, folks, I actually, I don't know if you can really focus on it, but you might notice that the delegation leading the march is from Connecticut. So I, I guess it's always good to know that we're first in something, right? <laughs> uh, by the 1980s, as a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, what you found was that Connecticut was a popular ground for this. Um, in the 1980s, we had the highest per capita membership in the Ku Klux Klan in the country. And so actually, it was not a very unpopular organization. It was really seen as something kind of upholding that American way of life, but to African Americans, it wasn't seen like that at all. This was seen as a terrorist organization. And folks, if I come to your house and say, don't vote, or you're not going over there, you're not going to go into that store, or I'll burn you out, we could see that essentially that is a terrorist message. There's not much of a question about it. But what this is going to do is begin to have a great effect on the people here in the South. Now, up until 1915 or so, African Americans had almost overwhelmingly been in agriculture, and in agriculture had almost overwhelmingly been in the cotton trade. Now, this is going to be an important thing for us to remember, folks. When we look at African American culture, in terms of literature, in terms of uh, sculpture, in terms of painting, there is none. There really is none at all. At this point, this is what you're doing. And I, I gotta tell you folks, if you've ever seen a cotton crop coming in, the days that you will work will be 16 to 18 hours long. You're gonna be out in the fields picking all the time. If you can straighten up at the end of the day, I congratulate you. It is back-breaking work. There's a reason when people say you're a cotton-picking liar that that's a bad thing. That's basically as low as it's going to go. Now, here's something else, and that is, suppose you're a kid out here picking cotton, and you've decided that what you want to do with your life is write poetry or write a great short story. And so while everyone's out picking, you finally say, oh, my God, I got it. And everyone stands up and says, what happened? You said, I got a rhyme for the word orange. <laughs> you'd probably be figured as the biggest weirdo in the village. And people would essentially shun your company. You want to remember this because here in the South, you really don't have much time to produce a great culture. You do have the other element that we often use as one of the producers of culture, and that is great oppression. Because throughout history, folks, great oppression tends to make great art. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're wealthy, you just don't have enough hunger to be able to make something that's really going to connect with people at times. And so, in around 1915, you have a lot of people here who are beginning to think, like this kid here, he would like to have nothing more than to talk to at least somebody who knows what poetry sounds like. 
to talk to somebody who actually thinks that painting is okay, he has no chance to. Not only that, but his entire family is essentially being kept down by the forces of social oppression in the South. And then what's going to happen to change this is going to be something very simple. And that is a tourist who will not go home. Beginning in the 1830s, an insect began to make its way north through the south, the area that we call the cotton belt. This insect is known as the boll weevil. Now the boll weevil is about, actually I could probably have one on my, the, the pinky's, pinky nail right there. Very small little creature, all right? And they only really have one purpose in life, and that is to eat cotton bolls. And so what they will do is get into cotton when it's still within the little bud here, right? Now this is going to open up and it's going to produce a bowl, or at least it would have, but the bowl weevil got in here first. And so, what they're going to do is eat this out, and instead of having this, which is what a healthy cotton field looks like, folks, right? And this is what we would pick. Instead, beginning in 1915, all over the South, this is what your cotton fields looked like. You produced almost no cotton whatsoever. Immediately, when the, when the boll weevil begins to hit the south and begins to hit the major cotton crops, African Americans begin to move north. They begin to move north not because they, they think it's going to be great up north. They begin to no move north because not only are they oppressed, not only are they isolated and poor, now they don't have any work either. And so this begins something that in the United States is called the Great Migration. And we'll talk about this in just a second. But African American families are going to start taking to the roads any way they can. Buses, trains, ships going up the coast. And what we will see is a major transplantation of culture during this time. Now African Americans are going to move up essentially in kind of a few different ways. As they move up the coast, cities like Baltimore and New York and Boston will begin to have larger and larger African-American populations. Around the time of the Civil War, folks, there were only about 9,000 African-Americans in Connecticut. Very small populations, tended to be right down by the coast here. Now we're going to start seeing tens of thousands of people moving north. Up the rivers, the Mississippi River is a big uh, route for this, and I'll mention that when I talk about music in a while. But as they move north, what we find is that right up until about 2010, this was the general trend of African American history. Now what we find is that that trend is reversed. Now sociologists talk about a great reverse migration, and African Americans are moving back down south. However, as they move north, they are going to leave behind them that cotton, and believe it or not, the south is actually happy to see the boll weevil come in in many places, folks. And the reason is very simple. This, you might notice, is a very kind of Greco-Roman looking memorial. You might notice at the top that there is an insect at the top of that memorial. That is the memorial to the boll weevil. And in 1919, they set this up. In profound appreciation of the boll weevil and what it has done as the herald of prosperity, this monument was erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama. The reason they like the boll weevil is because before 1915, there was only one product you made down south, and that's cotton. It's only after 1915 that industry becomes to, begins to go down south. It's only after 1915 that professions begin to go down south. And so actually, they're quite profoundly grateful to the boll weevil for doing what it had done. Now, this does make people kind of move up north a great deal, all right? And then we are going to see the other major event before the uh, Renaissance itself, and that is the First World War. Now, we're aware of the First World War. It was fought between 1914 and 1918. And that war is considered at the time to be the most horrific war the human race had ever fought. That war was, for many African Americans, their introduction into a bigger world. Now, when African Americans went over to Europe, at first, African Americans were not allowed to be fighting soldiers. They were drafted into the army. They were allowed to enlist. And then they were usually made into stevedores, loaders, cooks, servants to officers. They were kept in subservient positions. Now, when the Americans first go over to Europe, the Americans tell the French and the British, who've been fighting there for three years, that they want time to train their men, and they want them under separate command. They don't want the French or English commanding them because they've done terrible jobs so far, and we are going to do better with this. And so 
all over the American army, guys are just waiting to fight, and they can't really, right? Among these are African American units. This particular one is known as the 15th New York National Guard. And what will happen to them is that the French will come in and make a request for, specifically for American soldiers. We need somebody willing to fight. And the Americans say, well, we got all these African American soldiers who are really ticked off about the fact that they're not on frontline fighting units, and so here you go. So you might notice that these African American soldiers are not wearing American uniforms. They're wearing French uniforms. And they become the 369th Regiment. Um, they're also known as the Hell Fighters. This is, by the way, the most highly decorated American outfit from World War I. These folks actually do a very good job in the war, but we do know about the war itself. The war is a horrific thing. I just show you this picture to kind of talk about that for a minute. You're probably aware that World War I was the first war that extensively used the machine gun, the first one that used the airplane, but also the first one that used poison gas. It's also the first war where entire civilian populations are going to be terrorized. And so, as the African Americans get over here, especially in the 369th, as they get into the front lines and see what's going on, they begin to have a very different attitude than other American soldiers. One soldier in the 369th said this, as we saw the dead dimly through rifts of battle smoke and heard faintly the cursing and accusations of blood brothers, we darker men said, this is not Europe gone mad. This is not aberration or insanity. This is Europe. This seeming terrible is the real soul of white culture. Back of all culture, stripped and visible today. This is where the world has arrived. These dark and awful depths and not the shining and effable heights of which it boasted. African American soldiers come back and with a lot of them, they've really kind of looked behind the curtain now and they do not feel the kind of intimidation that they had felt 30 or 40 years before. There's something else you're going to find in Paris, or that is in France as well. Now, first of all, these gentlemen, and I thought you might want to see them. These are uh, actually the men in the 369th who received the Croix de Guerre, the, the war cross from the French army. Croix de Guerre is about the same thing as our Medal of Honor, folks. So if you understand, it's the highest decoration the French will bestow. Good many of them get it, and you might notice when they're coming back, I, I always like to look at their faces because it's interesting to see them kind of close up photographic representation. They're pretty tough looking guys. They don't look like the kind of people who are going to come back and meekly submit to being made kind of the guys picking the cotton again. And in fact, we're going to find a lot of things about this. These soldiers, when they come back, they're going to bump up the membership of the NAACP a great deal. These guys are kind of ready to fight. Now, there's something else that they see as well, and this is really going to fuel a lot of the Harlem Renaissance. They see Paris. Now, folks, if you want to see Paris, I mean, we all see it, right? I don't know if you've ever heard this, but Paris in the Fall. Have you ever heard this? I've never seen Paris in the Fall, but it does seem, sound like a very nice thing. Paris is for lovers, right? But for the African-American soldier, Paris meant two things. Number one, Paris meant equality. Because you could walk the streets of Paris, and you could go to places, and you could actually hang out. This is actually a picture from a Paris bar in the 1920s. You might notice something that would seem real weird to an African American at the time, and that is, uh, on the drink side of the bar, you've got folks who are white and black hanging around together without any real pretension about it. And on the left side, all of your servers are white. Now that's weird, right? And so as they get over here, they begin to see that this is a place where suddenly there is no segregation. There are forms of prejudice, but this particular form of prejudice does not exist there. You can do anything you want. You can go to the movies. You can date a woman. Nobody will do anything about it. The other thing about this is that African Americans, when they go over in World War I, will bring with them one of the first of the major achievements of African American culture and that is jazz music. The very first recordings of jazz music will hit France in 1917. By the time the Americans go home in 1919, it is a wildly popular form of music, even among the French themselves. And immediately, what we have is this incredible status awarded to African Americans as purveyors of this great culture, which at home, quite frankly, no one really even knows about yet, folks. Um, jazz at this time is confined to a couple of districts in New Orleans and the Mississippi River Delta. Not much else besides that. So as the men begin to come back from war, 
they're going to see that now they've got a, a world that is very different than the one they had left behind. And when they come back, of course, they're going to meet up with the same prejudice that they had met up with before. Here, marching up Broadway, the 369th is not allowed to march with the other troops in the American army because it was a segregated parade. And so, as they marched, the 369th actually had their own uh, parade. They actually, believe it or not, folks, what they did was literally walked behind everyone else up the Avenue of the Americas until they got to about 125th Street, where Harlem is. And then they had their own parade. And most people said, if you went to two of them, you know, like the, the, the conventional and then theirs, that theirs was a big party. Everybody's real happy to be there, right? So they're going to be walking up here. They're really well received by their folks. They've seen in Europe what they uh, kind of, what they see of white society, what they've seen of the status that they've gained. But of course, they also see this. In city after city after city during the First World War, race riots broke out everywhere. This one is actually in uh, Chicago, and you see the gentleman right here. He's being actually saved from a lynch mob by the police. And what the guy did is there's a policeman on a horse here. Um, this mob that you see back here was ready to hang this guy, and the policeman came in, um, used his horse as kind of a, a buffer, you might say, which is a very effective buffer. Nothing like 900 pounds of animals stepping on your foot to make you move, but also <laughs> drew his gun until the other police could get there. This happens all over the United States, folks. And so we're kind of seeing things being, kind of gauntlets being thrown down. African Americans are getting more militant. They're less willing to accept what they were willing to accept in the past. And now they are going to begin to come together in places like Memphis, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Chicago, or here. One of the most popular destinations for African Americans will be the formerly very wealthy middle class area known as Harlem. Now Harlem in the 1920s is largely an abandoned area. However, it's an abandoned area that had been the home of people like the Astors. If you understand, very wealthy, right? Very nice architecture up here, but the, the, essentially the very wealthy have moved further out by now. So they're already starting to get up into Westchester, for instance, and that's where they're gonna be kind of building their homes. And so here, there's a lot of really nice buildings a lot of nice storefronts, and a lot of places for African Americans to come together culturally. So folks, that kid who was looking for the rhyme to orange is now going to begin to find other people who think that's an important thing to start looking at. And when you begin to get this kind of synergy and this kind of interaction, the Harlem Renaissance will be born. Now the man who gives us that name, the Harlem Renaissance, is this man. This is Alan Locke. Now the Harlem Renaissance was called at the time the New Negro Movement. But of course, since then, with the changes in language, we've gone a, a little bit different with it. We prefer Dr. Locke's uh, 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 definition of the Harlem Renaissance. And what he said about Harlem is that Harlem is neither slum, ghetto, resort, or colony, though it isn't part all of them. It is, or promises at least to be, a race capital. Negro life is not only founding new centers, but finding a new soul. The wash and rush of the human tide on the beach line of the northern city centers is to be explained primarily in terms of a new vision of opportunity, of social and economic freedom. In the Negro's case, a deliberate flight not only from countryside to city, but from medieval America to modern. And so they're going to come together in the city, and what's going to happen? Well, no one really knows yet. But as early as 1917, we begin to have inklings of what's coming next. This is Torrance Ridgely, uh, and this man is a playwright. In 1917, he wrote three plays for a modern Negro theater. Now, these plays, it's interesting, written by a white man, were called by uh, James Weldon Johnson the most important single event in the entire history of the Negro in the American theater. And the reason he says this is because these three plays presented African Americans with the same types of scenes you would have seen in almost any play by Arthur Miller, any play by Eugene O'Neill as well. They, talking about spiritual loss, talking about ambition, uh, frustrated ambition, and thus African Americans begin to be seen as legitimate subjects of artistic expression. Now, something else today, and that is Alan Locke said that with the new Negro movement, 
that the Negro today wishes to be known for what he is, even in his faults and shortcomings, and scorns a craven and precarious survival at the price of seeming to be what he is not. He resents being spoken for as a social ward or minor, even by his own, and to being regarded a chronic patient for the sociological clinic, the sick man of American democracy. Religion, freedom, education, money. In turn, he has ardently hoped for and peculiarly trusted in these things. He still believes in them, but not in blind trust that they alone will solve his life problem. When you hear that quote, folks, you can hear the anger in it. You can hear also the aggressive ambition in it. Absolutely different from anything you would have heard from an American author or intellectual at this time. Keep in mind, folks, have you ever heard of the name Franz Kafka? Right? right? Kafka, the metamorphosis, the man who wakes up in the morning and finds himself turned into a beetle in his own bed. Nothing like finding yourself now having six legs, an exoskeleton, and when he comes down to breakfast, here he is, a six-foot beetle. His family is only interested in how, now that he's so ugly, how will he actually sell enough stuff to pay the rent for the family, right? This is Kafka's view of 20th century America. Look at this guy's view. This is something where now we are going to want to move forward, and you can kind of tell they're not going to let many people stand in their way. And in fact, you even get a more militant strain of this in the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which is headed by this man, Marcus Garvey. Now, you may have heard of the Back to Africa movement, and this was also begins with Garvey. Garvey actually is a more extreme activist, and he actually believes that African Americans would probably be best just going literally back to Africa themselves. To this end, he opens up the Black Star Line, and that is a, a steamship line that will take people from America over to Africa. If you're going to stay, however, what he believes is that African Americans should make their own way. All the professions, all the businesses, all the real estate. And so, he opens up, for instance, a nursing corps known as the Black Cross that goes, of course, with the Red Cross that had been um, started in the USA by uh, Clara Barton in 1867. Um, and not only this, but all kinds of parades are going to be happening through this area, especially in Harlem. And you might notice on the left, the sign in the car says, the new Negro has no fear. This is really very much that they're going to be defying people like the Ku Klux Klan. And you want to remember, this is a national organization, not just a southern one, much as we would like to think that. And so what we find is that in, into this mix, social, political, economic, cultural, the Harlem Renaissance will be born. Now again, I said at the beginning that when we think of the Renaissance, we generally will think of people that we know of today, very famous. So you think of Duke Ellington. We think of people like uh, Cab Calloway, for instance. We don't often think about how broad and wide the Harlem Renaissance actually was. Um, actually, part of it was religious, and there were going to be many variations on uh, basic Christian messages during this time. This one, for instance, right, talking about the evolution of the world, evolution of man, religion, evolution of pain and evil in the light of evolution. This is a lecture that seeks to reconcile Darwinism and religion. And you will find also that it is not only this type of work going on. This is where you begin to find the Nation of Islam, for instance, coming into New York uh, through New Jersey. And they're going to be advocating a much more activist African America than we'd seen before. But also, if we look at the Harlem Renaissance, it's not going to be just spiritual. Um, it will have many different aspects. This is Richmond Barté, probably the first of the very famous African American sculptors during uh, the Harlem Renaissance. This is one large aspect of it. Just wanted to show you a piece by Barthé. This is Booker T. Washington. It was done in 1946. And again, if you look at him, you'll notice in the face the extremely strong eyes and right there around the mouth, right? This is a very dynamic piece of art, folks. Looking toward the future, and this is a guy who does not look like he's really scared of the future. Looks quite steady toward it. And again, I would remind you that this is the time when T.S. Eliot is coming out with the wasteland, right? When people are thinking about Western civilization, is, as Oswald Spengler would say, is the decline of the West. African America is not thinking this whatsoever. This is Aaron Johnson, one of the very famous painters from the uh, Harlem Renaissance. 
And Aaron Johnson is considered the first major African-American painter. And once again, folks, this is a painting called And the Stars Began to Fall. But you would never have seen this in the 1870s or 80s. He wouldn't have had the materials. He wouldn't have had the money. He certainly wouldn't have had the time to begin to construct these kinds of works of art. And so we begin to see all kinds of different movements through this. Fashion also becomes a very big part of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, if you were going to go uptown and you were going to go out as a fashionable person, uh, Harlem became one of the centers of New York fashion. And for a while, in the late 20s, but this is only for a couple of years, it will be considered the, almost the equivalent of Paris or Milan. It's really a very famous fashion center. Now, that's going to change a little bit when the 30s come on, but that'll be a different story, really. Now, we find that there are really a couple of areas in the Harlem Renaissance that are very, very famous. One is literature, the other one is music. And in literature, again, keep in mind what I just told you about Eliot's poem, The Hollow Men, right? This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. This is Gene Toomer. Toomer was actually mixed race, partially West Indian, partially white, partially African American. And when he writes, he begins to write in a language we really haven't heard before. Just wanted to show you a couple of uh, samples of this, right? Um, Richard Eldridge, who's a great literary critic of the time, said that Toomer sought to transcend standard definitions of race. I think he never claimed he was a white man. See, he could have. Because he was mixed race, he could have gone for white. Uh, and many light-skinned black people did because it was a good way to survive in a world where segregation and prejudice were the norms. Right? He always claimed that he was a representative of a new emergent race that was a combination of various races. He averred this virtually throughout his life. And the language that he uses is going to be extremely strong, right? Uh, something that uses words in new ways, much like some of the other people here. I wanted to show you a couple of the more famous uh, writers of the Renaissance. This is Claude McKay. He may be the most famous poet of the Harlem Renaissance at the time, although today, Langston Hughes is usually the guy we, we think about. But this is what he writes about in his poem, America. He says, although she feeds me bread of bitterness and sinks into my throat her tiger's tooth, stealing my breath of life, I will confess I love this cultured hell that tests my youth. Her vigor flows like tides into my blood, giving me strength erect against her hate. And folks, this is nothing like T.S. Eliot and what he's writing at the time. These folks know very well, you read this, they know very well that they're moving forward and they're not really going to be moving back again. And we see a few other people, too, because we see other themes coming into Harlem Renaissance literature. This is Jessie Redmond Fawcett, and she actually wrote a story that's kind of interesting. Jessie Redmond Fawcett wrote, uh, There is Confusion, and this was a story of two middle-class families, both African-American, struggling to make it in America, one wealthier than the other, talking about the opportunities open to the wealthier ones and the obstacles facing the poorer ones. And so you'll find that in here she will begin to deal with things like uh, spousal abuse. She will begin to deal with homosexuality in ways that we've not seen before. So we want to remember, she's not just writing here for a small crowd of people. This is very much a universal thing happening at this time. Other people are writing about these same things. D.H. Lawrence, for instance. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, as I had said before. Um, this, of course, is the most famous writer of the Harlem Renaissance. His name is Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes as well, if you look at Claude McKay's poem, America, you see the same kind of thoughts for Mr. Hughes. He says, I too, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare to say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America, right? Again, this same year is when T.S. Eliot comes out with The Wasteland, which opens up saying, April is the cruelest month, mixing memory and desire, right? Basically talking about the end of Western civilization, one going up, one going down. And we see this over and over with the Renaissance. This is a, a County Cullen. Another aspect of the Renaissance is that it brings together both African American and West Indian artists, and he is actually from the West Indies. Uh, and what he writes again is uh, just kind of an interesting thing. Actually, to be honest, I don't know why I included this, but I think it's an incredible poem, right? 
a brown girl dead, right? And he writes, with two white roses on her breasts, white candles at her head and feet, dark Madonna of the grave she rests, Lord Death has found her sweet. Her mother pawned her wedding ring to lay her out in white. She'd be so proud she'd dance and sing to see herself tonight. Mm -hmm. The second stanza that really kind of disturbs me, if you understand what I mean. But again, if you look at the power in here, the, this is really a, a movement that's kind of seeing itself as kind of titanic and just emerging and very aware of itself. Now, probably the most famous novel written during the Harlem Renaissance is by this man. This is Wallace Thurman. Uh, Wallace Thurman, as you can see, a very young man in this. He actually dies at age 32. He's uh, mm -hmm. tubercular. And so he only puts out one major novel during his time. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But when he describes New York, again, you see this kind of uh, love and hatred, both at the same time for it. The tenements in this vicinity are darkened dung heaps, festering with poverty-stricken and crime-ridden stepchildren of nature. This is the edge of Harlem's slum district. Fifth Avenue is its boardwalk. Push carts line the curbstone. Dirty push carts manned by dirtier hucksters selling fly-specked vegetable and other cheap commodities. Evil faces leer at you from doorways and windows. Brutish men elbow you out of the way. Dreary-looking women scowl at and curse children playing on the sidewalk. That is Harlem's Fifth Avenue. Right, have you ever been to New York, folks? So, you know, there's never a pure love relationship with New York, right? There's always an element of, my God, look at the dirt, you know? Then it's kind of nice, right? I always, I always know it because when you go by a stand of somebody selling either chestnuts or pretzels, I don't know about you, that's all I can think of is New York City. And then I think, my God, I better watch out for my wallet. So, I, yeah, I don't know, pretzels especially, they can go kind of expensive on you. However, the, the book that he writes is called The Black or the Berry. And what's really interesting about this novel is that he talks about this young woman um, and she is afflicted with the thought that lighter-skinned black people are prejudiced against her. She's a darker-skinned black person. And through her whole life, this is what basically will kind of guide her from broken relationship to broken relationship. It's interesting because at the end, she will leave this, this guy who's abusing her, who's using her for her good heart. But when she leaves, it's interesting, he always makes sure to say, that she made sure to pack all her baggage before she left, right? So you kind of know that she's not really gonna have a better life out of this. And in this, he's really talking to a couple of different things. Talking to the idea of prejudice in our society and what it's going to do to people. No matter where you go, there you are, and that prejudice is going to meet up with you, right? But um, we also see a couple of other people. I just wanted to point out one other writer. Um, this is probably one of the most a tart-tongued people I've ever read. Her name is Zora Neale Hurston. And Hurston, again, a writer of many different things, essays, short stories, and uh, uh, some, a couple of plays as well. Um, Hurston was considered by many to be really the intellectual queen of the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, I think if she were here, she'd probably laugh at that a lot and probably say a bunch of things that really kind of offended everybody in the room. She enjoyed doing that kind of stuff. Most of her quotes, unfortunately, I really can't put up on the board because the state of Connecticut would find out and fire me for them. She really is very kind of open about the, uh, uh, the question of race in New York. And one of the reasons for this is that really African Americans, as they're producing this art, until 1926, they're really not going to have any chance to publish most of this stuff. In fact, this is Charlotte Osgood Mason. And uh, again, you might have noticed this with the NAACP, very wealthy, white society woman. In 1926, she is the first person who begins to expose writers of the Harlem Renaissance to major publishers in New York. And from here, they begin actually to get a lot more notoriety because they begin to get published on a national scale instead of on a local one. Now, the other uh, thing that we want to talk about here, and just to kind of close us out, we'll be talking about music. Now, one of the things about World War I and about the boll weevil is that, as I said before, it caused African Americans to go north. And one of the great roots of northern migration is right up here along the Mississippi River. Now, the reasons for this are fairly uh, kind of complex. There's a lot of different things that come into it. But by World War I, a lot of jazz musicians are beginning to see that where they play, and folks, this is not a stereotype statement. Uh, anyone would tell you the same thing. 
Jazz players only had one place they could get gigs around 1900, and that was bordellos. So essentially, a guy like Louis Armstrong, if you ask him when he was born, I don't know if you've ever heard this from him, he was born July 4th, 1900 in a whorehouse. He'll tell you that every time. Very <laughs> proud of him, right? Um, probably all three are false, but it is a great sounding story, right? Um, but the fact is, this is where you played, the Red Light District, and this is Storyville. Now, in 1915, you begin to have movement out of um, the area of the South, so you do begin to lose some business here. But in 1917, America goes to war, and the biggest port on the eastern side of the United States, that is, in the Atlantic side, is New Orleans. Now, when the Navy begins to gather in New Orleans, there are so many murders, so many fires, so many brawls and riots down in this area, that in 1917, the Navy Department closed Storyville down. It simply wiped it all out. That's why all I can show you is a postcard. It does not exist anymore, folks. It's been raised. But what will happen, is that musicians will begin to go right up the Mississippi River. If you're familiar with blues, folks, you probably know the towns like Natchez Trace, you know towns like Tupelo, you know towns like Memphis, you know towns like St. Louis, you know towns like Kansas City, and ultimately Chicago. All the blues towns right up along the river, right where it all gets bad, out in the docks of the city there, right? And you will find people like this. Louis Armstrong moves north, and he is invited up by a man named King Oliver to get into a band in Chicago. And that's where he begins to make his uh, career, considered one of the great jazz musicians of all time. Um, he actually, once he gets up there about 1920, he really never changes his style. He's going to remain very popular, but he's also considered one of these people who's kind of an ambassador for African American music. I will tell you folks, I, I lived over in Hungary, and if you ever met anyone in Hungary and said, oh, do you know jazz music? The first thing that they would all say is, yes, in 1962, Louis Armstrong played the Nebstadion, which is the, the big people's stadium. It was the largest crowd he ever played for, and the Hungarians couldn't play him money, so they all gave him Zsolnoy pottery. I gotta tell you, I've been told that story so many times, <laughs> I don't even know what to do with it anymore, right? It's kind of interesting. But you see him here, he is considered really one of the nice guys of jazz. He's considered a popular man. Until the end of his life, you could literally walk up into his apartment, knock on the door, and his wife would let in to talk to Louis Armstrong, you know, which would have been great. I wish, however, I was born 10 years before I was. But besides being one of the great uh, trumpet players, he is also a guy who really popularizes music. And in New York, jazz will begin to explode on the scene. Now, so will show tunes. These are two people you might know, Noble Sissel is sitting at the piano, and the other guy there is named Yubi Blake. And they actually begin to um, come out with some, some off-Broadway and Broadway stuff during the 1920s. Now, one thing you'll find about these guys that's very different from what we've seen before is that up until now, when you see black players on the stage or white players, you will generally see white players in black face. It's very, very common to see at the time. You're probably familiar with pictures of Al Jolson, for instance, very commonly appears like this, all right? For the first time, we are going to see black players appearing pretty much as they actually look. And this is going to be a ground-shaking change for a, a lot of audiences. Now again, this is just a, a, a poster from uh, one of their uh, plays that they put on in New York. But you're going to see a lot of major figures come out of this now. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this man before. His name is Bill Bojangles Robinson. And if you're familiar with tap dancing, there's tap dancing and there's this guy because this is the god of tap dancing. He's still considered this. Um, next month, when I talk about entertainment in the 30s, I will talk about the great, the real great star of the 1930s, which you and I both know as Shirley Temple. Mm -hmm. And Shirley Temple said he was not only the best dancer she'd ever seen, but that he was probably the nicest guy to her about the business that she ever met as well. She considered him a mentor until he died, pretty much. But what's really interesting, folks, about this, and for me anyway, about this particular figure is, you always wonder about him. Um, he is a tap dancer. He's also considered one of the people who really perpetuates the stereotype of this African-American kind of happy-go-lucky guy. You notice on his face, he is kind of a happy person, right? Um, however, the notoriety he gained and the money he gained were also a case for saying, geez, you know, I mean, who cares what you look like if you're basically making the money that you need to become a powerful figure? 
I mean, very controversial in this way, even today. You'd still kind of see this idea of exactly what did he do? Was it good, or did it actually have drawbacks for African Americans as well? Um, you see a few more people as well. During this time, we will get some of the great African American figures of the 20th century. This is one of my favorites. This is Josephine Baker. Um, if you're familiar with Josephine Baker, you've probably heard of the banana dance, which is that she danced in nothing but stringing bananas, which was terrible. And I don't know about you guys, I've been looking for videos of it for months, can't find <laughs> anything, you know? But everyone would come to New York when she was doing the banana dance, everyone, you'd see them lined up down the street, you know, what are you doing here? I want to see what kind of filth they're putting on in these places, you know, here's my money, right? And actually, she actually moves over to Paris during the 1920s, and there will take French citizenship. She's considered kind of exotic, but what's really interesting about her, I have to kind of add this in, because it's not really Harlem Renaissance, is that during World War II, she was a little bit older. So now she's in her late 30s into her 40s, and she used to entertain German officers at the club. I don't mean anything weird by that, right? So I'm not talking about anything strange, but she spied for the French. She was a very effective spy, and in fact, was given uh, a very high-ranking medal by the French after the war. She was considered one of the great French citizens of the 20th century, but never really came back here too much. Came back to do a few shows, would come back for weddings or funerals, but that's about it for her. Another one of the people that we find great all-around figures is this man, Paul Robeson. Now, Robeson, if you walked into the room, you'd probably pay attention to him. The guy stood about 6'3", 6'4". He played football. He was also a lawyer. He was also a labor organizer and one of the great spiritual singers of our history. And so when you see him here, right, he's singing Old Man River. Look at the size of the guy, right? <laughs> this is a, a substantial man, right? Um, you probably are aware as well that as he goes through the 1920s and into the 30s, he becomes a communist and he becomes involved in um, not fighting in, but it becomes involved in the Spanish Civil War. His future will really be checked by the U.S. government because he will go over to the Soviet Union a bunch of times. He likes Stalinist Russia, which for a lot of people is a little bit over the edge. In the 1950s, essentially, uh, the HUAC, which is the House Un-American Activities Committee, puts him in front of them and tries to grill him on his uh, communist and fellow traveler leanings. And basically, he just tells him to go, you know, to go to blazes. And he said, I'm not going to let any Nazi tell me what to do. Do you understand? Yes, we do. And they took away his passport, and he really never performed again. The U.S. government was very careful about this. They did not like communists in their midst. But what he did was a lot of things. First, you're probably familiar with Old Man River, because you can't kind of be not familiar with it if you're in the United States. Everyone sings it, right? Um, this was his, so a lot of the spirituals you will hear. Also, he did some great screen work. Off his uh, Othello on Broadway in 1931 is considered one of the classics of the, the genre of, uh, of plays. So this is a guy who's quite interesting. Goes into a lot of different areas. But when we really talk about music, we're really talking about the places that we think of here. Cotton Club, for instance. You've probably all heard of this, right? This is really the jazz age. I always like this interesting. The Cotton Club was also highly segregated. And so the only people who could be out in the audience were actually white. Uh, the only time you could actually get into the Cotton Club if you were African American is if you were playing on the stage. And you still had to use the back door. Um, a lot of people are actually going to kind of use that to their advantage. And this is one woman, uh, Lena Horn, who actually did use this through her life. For a lot of years, she found herself light-skinned enough to be able to play white. And that's what she did. Uh, right up until basically her 40s, she was allowed to do things because segregation, you know, she kind of slipped into the front door, nobody really noticed. And then she got famous enough to kind of ignore a lot of the segregation, which occurs, that, and, and of course that changes as well during the Second World War. So we're going to become a lot more liberal during that time. A lot more African Americans would probably be going down here, for instance, the Lafayette Club, which was actually desegregated. White and black could both come in here, kind of look around, dance, listen to the music. And this is where we really do get some people who are very famous. Mm. Cab Calloway is one. Um, if you ever see him later in his life, he doesn't move too fast, right? <laughs> but if you could ever find videos of him, and you can find them online, they're all over the place. 
It's like somebody gave him an awful lot of coffee before he went on stage. Like, James Brown, I'm sorry, is going to look like a geriatric next to this guy. But again, you know, he's going to really make this kind of music very popular. This man by himself is really going to change the way we look at popular music. Up until now, jazz has been essentially a horn-driven genre. This man is Fats Waller, and Fats Waller is going to develop a kind of style on the piano called jump style. And what he's going to do is make jazz a piano-based as well as horn-based style of music. When he does this, jazz begins to come into middle class and upper middle class homes. Because the piano, of course, is not something that we all own, folks. It's only something we own if we got the money to do so. But once jazz gets onto the piano, it also becomes a much more popular and much more national form of art. And of course, there's this man, who is uh, Duke Ellington. Ellington is probably the most accomplished popular music composer in American history. Um, folks, if you're familiar with, folk, uh, with people that have had long music careers, you'd be thinking about people like, uh, if you're familiar with Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel, he was writing songs back in 1963. He was writing pretty good music right up until the end of the 80s, right? That's a pretty long career, 25 years or so. Guy probably has a couple of hundred hits, right? This man, at his peak, which lasted for about five years, was writing two to three hit songs per week. Man's output is amazing. You're probably familiar with some of his output, things like Take the A Train, Sophisticated Lady. Um, uh, he is a very famous composer, and one other thing about him, you might notice, this is not a guy who dresses flamboyantly. He dressed impeccably. He spoke impeccably, and he did this very consciously because he sold his jazz to a very white, middle-class audience and did quite well at it. He was considered one of our great jazz artists right up till his death in 1974. And of course, one other person who gets her uh, start during the Harlem Renaissance uh, is this lady. This is uh, uh, Billie Holiday, probably familiar with her. 1920, she begins to sing. Unfortunately for her, um, she does get into big time jazz. The problem is she was also an advanced heroin addict for a lot of her adult life. And they actually barred her from a lot of the clubs in New York from singing right up until about the 1950s. And if you listen to her early and later recordings, you can really hear the effect that uh, drugs had on her because toward the end, she's really not producing what she had. But all of these people who are considered almost iconic in American culture, are going to begin to gather in that Harlem Renaissance. And that, so the 1920s in Harlem, at a time when you could go uptown, dress nice, go dancing. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, since alcohol is illegal, you can also go up to the Cotton Club and get alcohol as well. Mm -hmm. And that also might have attracted a few people to go up to the clubs. Um, and during the 1920s, you find this everywhere. However, this will change beginning in the 1930s. Now, just to kind of close me out, I just wanted to give you a couple of things. One is this quote, and that is, um, one of the writers of the Harlem Renaissance, a lesser known man, said, we younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark-skinned selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. We build our temples for tomorrow, strong as we know how, and we stand on top of the mountain, free within ourselves. An absolutely dynamic call for cultural progress and ambition. And we find, even today, that when we look around at popular uh, culture today, we really see in these first couple of lines a lot of reflection of this. By the late 1920s, it appeared that African Americans were going to dominate the entertainment industry in the United States and dominate American culture. Of course, in 1929, this all changes. Because in 1929, when the stock market crash occurs, our unemployment will go up to something around 38%. The numbers we have are not quite as accurate as they are today. But when unemployment goes up in America to 38%, it will affect African Americans in a disproportionate fashion. So there will be many more African Americans who are now out of work, who will be traveling, trying to look for a place that they can actually get a job, and they will be standing in line behind anyone else who wants to get one. 
And so in the 1930s, we see the Harlem Renaissance begin to wind down. In 1933, this is when it really comes to an end, because in 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt made alcohol legal again. Places like the Cotton Club, which had been these really rich, wealthy, very conspicuous areas to go, dress in your finest. During the Depression, we're not going to be as popular. You didn't want to show people you had money like that because it was kind of, it was kind of gauche to do so. But also, once you could get alcohol in a legal manner, yeah, who needed to go uptown now? You could just walk down the street, get some, and then bring it home. And thus, we see that the Harlem Renaissance will end in the Depression, and yet, the gains made here will not. We have seen ever since, solidly, in the entertainment industries, we have seen that African Americans will occupy a major position throughout history since the 1930s in American popular culture. Well, folks, that's my uh, presentation for today. I'd like to thank you very much for coming up. And, uh, site, but really it's just a yard at this point. It was very rare. Paul Robeson went to Columbia, uh, and he went to Columbia Law School for a while, um, but it's really not too common to find a, a lot of really higher education, especially on the uh, graduate and postgraduate level. How were they able to do that? Uh, usually by being so special that people just did not want to deny them entry. Mm -hmm. So Du Bois was an amazing sociologist. You know, uh, we usually think of him as somebody who creates and promotes the NAACP, which is a social organization. But um, his work in sociology is considered some of the best in American history. So, um, so I, I really think that he just stood out so much that it was impossible to deny him. At that point, you also have this kind of strange phenomenon that comes in with race relations. And that is, I, I, I'm not really sure how to put this in a way that doesn't make me sound really kind of rude about it. But when there's only one guy there, it's kind of an exotic. Do you understand? Mm. So in a sense, Harvard would have said, hey, here's our black guy. You know what I mean? Like, here's the guy that we have. Right? Columbia's got theirs. You know? It's when you begin to have a larger movement in, suddenly people begin to get challenged by that. That's when you begin to have the kind of pushback. Same thing in the South, really. If you think about it, um, if you're going to have African Americans emerge from slavery to own their own farms, you realize what they've been doing for 246 years. They've been doing all the farming. No plantation owner ever got his hands dirty. So you're asking them now to come out and be the competitors for all of these people who grow cotton. You understand, you don't want that to happen because they'll be dominant in that field very quickly. So this is, it's kind of interesting. When you see the numbers come up, that's when we begin to get the blowback. So uh, Du Bois, yeah, you could see him going there, but not many people, if you understand. Oh, please go ahead. You mentioned Bojangles. Uh, right. I don't know if they still exist, but there was a group called the Copacetics. They were dedicated to his memory. Really? Yeah. And uh, because he evidently used the expression everything's copacetic. Right. And it was a group back, oh God, I'm going to say 40 years ago, 30 years ago, of eight or ten black dancers who did tap soft shoe, sand dancing, right. and had an incredible program. Right. And right up there with the Preservation Hall jazz band in this area. <laughs> right. Nowadays, that's become different, because now you're kind of preserving memory. And you'll see, you'll get a lot of people doing that. Same with spirituals, gospel music. You get people who actually sing it today in churches, but you also get people who try to recreate the old styles. Um, I, I've never heard of the group. But I, it, I don't doubt that something like that would have existed, be, oh. simply because the, the man himself was so famous in, in tap. That it, he's really kind of considered the only major single figure. 
and then everyone else was kind of together. And they would say the same thing. I remember Gregory Hines, who was a great dancer in his own right, said the same thing. Like, we all dance, it's great. But Bill Bojangles Robinson is like, it's like we all drive a Geo Metro, he's a Mercedes, you know, so, you know, <laughs> kind of tough, but, you know. Please, the connection here that uh, Cap Calloway's daughter lived. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. When did, when did she live here? 1972 to yes. 77. In fact, 70. I went to a concert at Cap Calloway's uh, oh, during, yeah. at the Iverton Playhouse. And that, that was just when he was beginning to get yeah. a little bit older, right? Yeah, so he was him. certainly yeah. rather rotund at that yeah. point. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, toward the end. It's interesting to see him because if you really can, one of the things you can do is on YouTube, you can see his, his recordings from oh, back in incredible. the 20s, and he's something to watch, you know. It, it, you can really see the dynamism of the music. And also understand how when T.S. Eliot's talking about the wasteland, you know, you can see where people would want to turn to that. It's just a lot more up. I didn't know she lived here, though. That's really interesting. And his daughter's name was Cabela. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Bill Rager's house? Yes, yeah. yeah. And it, it married, very interesting, a Jewish man from Long Island. Well, okay. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you could, you know, yeah. Yeah. Cabela. That's yeah. great. Langsam. Yeah, I keep wanting to ask if the store is named after, but I'm not going to go that way, but, you know. Well, folks, oh, I'm sorry. The yeah. um, picture that you showed of the March on Washington, what year was that? Uh, you're talking about the, the, the new Negro has no fear, that one? Uh, well, it was the KKK. Oh, the KKK. That was, yeah. I'm sorry, that was 1924. 1924. Yeah, that's when actually the second Klan is interesting because, as I said, the first Klan was all soldiers. Right. The second Klan was very smart. And, I, and really, I, I realize it sounds bad to say, but you've got to take your hat off to this plan. What they did was they went into every town and they would get the mayor, the sheriff, the police, do you understand? Anyone in authority, those were the guys who belonged to the Klan. So the Klan was almost like your Elks Club or your the Moose Club, do you understand? If you were a professional, you were gonna be there, right? Um, and and it's, it's fascinating to see how powerful they were and how many people thought they were really looking out for the American way of life because they were very much equal opportunity in their hatred at that point. Um, you know, you, you find that the, the anti-Catholic stuff is very interesting to see, but it tends to be that way even today, you know. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for coming out today, folks.